The, the, the very first time I looked at the US market, we were thinking of entering years and years ago. And you know, it looks to me there's a clear opportunity for some you know, consolidation in that slightly higher end, less, um, less sort of a sensitive market. But in general, um, I didn't hear many people talking about level of sophistication. It was more around putting prices up, um, passing on those charges, relatively unsophisticated. That might sound brutal, but that's, well, that's my impression. In for a penny. Attention, you're entering a sugar-free opinion zone. Beware of spicy stories and shards of honesty. Straight Fire VR opinions are underway. Use is not recommended for the faint of heart. Joining us in the fight are two decorated guests who are sure to hit their marks. Coming in with over 20 years of experience in the digital transformation and is the current CEO at Sykes Cottages and Forge is Graham Donahue. Also joining us is another expert who has 15 years of experience in the C-suite and is in the current Chief Financial Officer at Vtrips is Paul Smith. I'm Heather Macias Milo, executive producer. Here to open fire on the latest targets facing the industry is our host, Steve Milo. Steve, when you are ready, take aim. All right. Thank you, Heather, Paul, and Graham. Um, I uh, wanted to bring you both here because uh, you were both at VRMA. Uh, we obviously have been uh, in, in London. Um, previously even visiting uh, Graham over at uh, Chester and his headquarter. But I'm just kind of curious. I'm going to start with Graham. Uh, Graham, you uh, went to the uh, VRMA International in Orlando. There were 2,500 uh, in attendance, 100 vendors, a lot of um, different sessions. And I'm sure you interacted with a lot of different um, people. What were your What's your impression of the U.S. market and even uh, kind of your view of the of VRMA and and how that whole event was handled. So, um, well, I've been a few times before. Um, I tend to go every maybe two or three years. I mean, the first thing I'll say is uh, it's an incredibly interesting, well attended event. I don't think there's anything like it in Europe of that scale, and um, it felt a bit like a family. I mean, everybody seems to know everybody. Everybody knows you, that's for sure. And uh, there was a lot of love in the room, you know, which was just good, and a lot of, a lot of sort of uh, um, kindred spirits, so to speak. So that's really interesting. I think when I look at, um, oh, actually, the other thing is you guys know how to party really well. I believe mean, those fringe events that go on and those things, it's incredible. But, if, but more seriously, I think um, the, the market, I was interested in understanding what's happening in the US market to try and get a read across to what's happening in the UK and Europe. It looks very similar to me. Um, challenging. Uh, challenging on rate, challenging on occupancy. Supply doesn't look quite as challenging, but I think an average is higher than a thousand sins. So that was sort of interesting. I think it was also just uh, good to, um, I guess, reaffirm some of my understanding of the market. So the market, I think, is like dead fragmented. So I was trying to understand a bit more about the market. You, know, you haven't managed to buy up everybody yet under fee trips, but um, it's super, super fragmented. That's a very different to what we see in certainly in the UK and in Europe as well. Um, very different in terms of how you think about guests, how you think about owners. And I don't know how much detail you want to unpack later. We can maybe get into it, but um, real difference in terms of you know how you think about the guests, how you think about the owners. Um, and I, mean, I don't know how many vendors were in that, were in that conference hall, it felt like there was hundreds, um, all selling you stuff, um, all taking a little bit of a slice in a vertically integrated model. You know, um, maybe that's why you can afford to charge us high commissions in the US market versus you know the street fighting low commission market of the of Europe. So that was interesting. Again, we can touch on that. And then um, the other thing that was interesting. Uh, we've done a lot of M and A, so just. Completely different market in terms of M&A, completely different valuations. Um, a bit of a lack of understanding, I think, in terms of uh, EBITDA, EBITDA margins. I didn't hear anybody talking about inversion. I didn't hear a lot about guest experience, but maybe I wasn't in the right sessions. And probably disappointed there wasn't enough about ESG. I know VRMA were 
there was, there was, there was a few um, sessions, but there's a lot more chatter, I would expect, just given, you know, the state of the planet. So I'll pause there and you can unpack all of that. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot to unpack. I, I will say, uh, as much as I enjoyed some of the parties, like Beyond Pricing, when uh, the tequila shots started going out, uh, I left at that point. But Paul Smith may have stayed a little longer. So, Paul, what was your observation of the VRMA event? So, Graham is, is absolutely right. Um, uh, it, it's always surprising to see the fragmentation in this market. And it, it makes no sense, Graham. Uh, one of the things that I find more attractive about this market, actually, is that fragmentation. And I think that fragmentation is actually driving uh, a lot of the other uh, aspects that, that 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 you very very acutely described. Uh, what one of the other things, Steve, is talking with the, my fellow property managers. Um, uh, it's it it is it is very true that most of them are still trying to understand what happened. Uh, and, and you know, there's no realization about this shorter but more intense economic cycle that was created post-COVID, first with the massive, uh, in, you know, influx of uh, uh, resources coming from the fiscal deficits that were incurred and basically people having been flushed with money, both on the supply side and on the demand side. Uh, and more likely than not, the demand side was the one that created the supply side cloud. Because what's, what's going on also, Graham, here is that uh, a lot of people decided that they were going to become owners of uh, vacation rentals. And, and you have that massive influx of, of new supply. Uh, and that new supply came with the real estate market uh, basically booming. So the prices that we, they entered the, the industry were not necessarily the same as the legacy players, let's call it that. And because of that, their expectation of returns is completely different uh, or, or what they basically need to even pay the mortgage. And, and so you have this, uh, a very intense economic cycle adjustment going on, you know, because obviously that massive influx of, of money into the economy created inflation. And, and now the government's stepping in to basically rein uh, that inflation down. And as it's doing it, it is, it is removing some of that disposable income. Uh, you're still seeing a very healthy demand overall, I think, in the U.S., uh, but, but it's, it's being allocated to more units. Uh, there's, there's simply more supply. And so the impact that has on rates, on overall occupancy, and so on, uh, it's 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 interesting to see, and it's also interesting to see how, uh, uh, and this will be the closing point, uh, and and this will go back to uh, to to one of Graham's comments as well, uh, so how consistently it is that those property managers that were focusing on the very fundamental aspects of what we actually do, are the ones that are faring better. Uh, and those that are more like fat driven or trying to go more with the new concept, and whatnot, are the ones that are struggling and even more confused as to what is going on. Um, and 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 one thing that that I also think it's it's really interesting is maybe this is the confusion from from the tech companies or not on the industry, but uh, there is this confusion about uh, whether or not they understand that we're in the hospitality industry and experience uh, both, or, or I would say experience for the owner, experience for the guest and experience for the employee is what actually drives the positive cycle in this industry. And there is very little discussion about it uh, uh, in terms of- yeah, there was, you... Sorry, there, there was a whole session which felt like an identity crisis. You know, uh, you know what do we call ourselves? <laughs> are we uh, uh, are we something else? Uh, 100%. And, 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 and it's not that. We're in the business of creating memories. And to create that memory, you need to have a, a, you need to have a unit and, 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 or, 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 or a home where you create it. And you need to have the staff that create that experience. So it's, if, if you don't have those components, it's not going to happen. And if you don't do it consistently, it's not going to happen. But, but anyhow, it, it is refreshing, though, Graham. Let me tell you something. Uh, as I said, uh, it, it seems to me like those companies that have uh, doubled down on those fundamentals were the ones, at least in my conversations, that seem to be doing better. So hopefully what's going to happen is that's going to drive some of the behavior uh, 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 of the rest of the industry. So so Graham, in, in between the parties and the bar sessions. I go to um, that was a good boy. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't see it. I didn't see you at the guestie party, but uh I may have seen you uh, at a bar here or there, but I was going to ask you a question. Um, Jason Sprinkle over at Key Data 
showed some pretty disturbing trends of the U.S. market. So down 11% in paid occupancy uh, and down 2% in um, in ADR. Uh, and, uh, you know, contrast that to Europe, which uh, was up significantly in uh, 2023, um, even with a 19% increase in unit count. So uh, Europe was you know, significantly better in terms of, of, of the industry, 16% overall rev par in Europe, which was pretty amazing. Now I know you're in the UK and I know the UK is somewhat different than, than Europe, but my question to you is when you look at those numbers for the U S market, does it give you pause about the U S market? Or do you think some of this is just a kind of a correction that the U S market opened a little earlier than Europe and uh, some of this correction is a pullback closer to 2019. Yeah, I think it's a reset moment um, you know, you're seeing in the US back to this, as you say, 2019. And I think, as you, you know, I think you, I think I heard you saying it um, either on stage or maybe at the bar, you know, you hardly closed in some states, you know, <laughs> whereas, you know, the UK and parts of Europe were 18 months, you know, on off, on off sort of a lockdown. So, there's definitely, I think, a little bit of a reset going back to sort of a 2019, which is tough, and it's a tough message, particularly for all that supply that came on board, as Paul just said, you know, because they, you know, those people still expect it. Um, it. You know, what's interesting in the US, I think, is that when I look at the US economy, I think actually your economy is doing really well versus European economy, and it's definitely doing a lot better than the UK. And maybe we'll come out to talk about some of the uh, macroeconomics, some of the factors that we're sort of seeing here. So it's, it's interesting that actually, despite having a better economy, let's just say, than some of the um, the other G7 countries and definitely better than sort of Europe as a whole, which has more got GDP growth at about two and a bit percent versus seven and a bit percent across the US. Um, you're still seeing uh, you're still seeing a sort of relatively challenging market. Um, in, in the UK, very specific, Steve, um, those numbers you mentioned from key data, we don't really see that in the UK. Um, the UK was definitely a much tougher 20, 2023. We saw demand down 15% year on year. Um, you know, it's much more concentrated to fewer sort of suppliers, uh, but we saw demand down about 15% sort of year on year. Therefore, um, everybody was fighting really hard to try and get, you know, because you can't afford to be down 50%. So we, we saw massive inflation in terms of acquisition costs of uh, customers and in terms of supply as well. Uh, my business, I look after, we spent £6 million more acquiring um, acquiring customers than we were forecast to because we can't afford to be 15% down, you know, because we've got, we had about 11% more supply. Well, well, Paul, um, I'm not sure if people were as candid with you as some were with me, but I talked to people and, and the consultants spoke pretty freely of companies that were literally uh, afraid they were going to run out of cash, right? These were companies in some cases who had never really faced adversity of the uh, housing bubble and, and all of that, probably new entries within the last 10 years. And in some cases, weren't even running budgets or variance reporting. Um, but I mean, in the US market, I mean, it's sobering, the slowdown, but that's slowdown is combined with high labor costs, right? So in some of the resort markets we're in, we've seen labor costs jump 30, 40% over 2019. And when you talk to people or, you know, managers who are trying to hire, they'll say, hey, some of the problem is Walmart's paying $17 an hour. We we have to pay at least that to be competitive. So Paul, did you hear some of these conversations? Because I mean, I definitely heard people say, hey, I'm really concerned um, you know, cash is really dwindling in some of these markets, like the Outer Banks, which Graham was right. The Outer Banks was almost filled the whole year between 2021 and 2022. They're going back to 2019 levels of occupancy. At the same time, ADR is going down. And then all of their labor costs went up and you can't get those labor costs down because the unemployment's so low. Yeah, Graham is not saying that he fared better over the summer from the amount of Americans going into Europe. And this past summer. So we, uh, yeah, e economically speaking, Graham, we're doing so well that we're exporting all of our travelers uh, to Europe. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Listen, uh, I, was, I was at the Ryder Cup um, 
in Rome. Uh, there was a lot of Americans at the Ryder Cup in Rome, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, in all seriousness, uh, the U.S. economy as a macro is doing really better. Uh, and but, but, but then when you basically open the hood uh, and you start looking at, for example, uh, consumer confidence, Graham, uh, you start seeing the cracks all over. Uh, and the way the U.S. consumer assesses uh, how, you know, it, whether or not the economy is doing well or not and, and how confident he is that his proxies are, are improving are, are, are more influenced by, I would say, the routine type of transactions. Like when they go and, 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 put, and you know, put gas on their car, they go to the, uh, uh, to the supermarket uh, to buy groceries and they, and they see that there's a 20 percent increase on their, uh, on their weekly bill. Uh, and, and and that gives them less confidence. Uh, and on the flip side, um, what Steve's saying is right. Uh, you, you have this massive expectations of revenue, probably simply because that's that's the new normal that you were expecting, and you were spending money uh, in hiring people and and providing for all of those, and not very mindful of a cash flow. And and then there's a as I said, very short shift. Uh, in terms of the cycle, not not what you would expect, but a very sudden drop in demand that happens even because it, it what happened in the U.S. is you started seeing uh, the length of stay compress, but you'll start seeing the booking window compress, and it, it and it started compressing very rapidly. So people were still hopeful, uh, you know, weeks uh, out of the summer that you know every summer we get a hundred percent occupancy, so we're going to get a hundred percent occupancy this year as well. There shouldn't be any discounts. And you could see them holding on the rates uh, until they basically lost or, or that inventory went stale because nobody booked it. Um, and, and once they run into that situation and they don't have their, uh, I would say, their reserves formed from the summer, now they have to face the fourth quarter with very little occupancy and depleted uh, cash balances. So so it's this right. Does that, does, that, does that mean there's going to be lots of... Um opportunities to buy up poor performing businesses that run out of cash um, at a low cost. Well, and okay. if it's a good indicator, I have received or started receiving, you know, offers from owners saying, Hey, you know, are you guys buying? We're interested. And and now different from the other discussions, uh, I think there is a multiple compression. So it started to make sense again uh, uh, to go into that mode. Now, unfortunately, the cost of capital is, is so expensive that you still need more compression to go on. Uh, but but I do see I do see that this is going to discourage and, and Steve said it very very clearly uh, as people you know people that have never been through a crisis right or 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 a, or a crunch in terms of activity uh, maybe they're disappointed maybe everything was nice you know in 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 you know when they entered the industry to now and and they're disappointed uh, because this is not an industry you know this is not a, a an easy uh, uh, thing to do we're dealing with man to man combat in every single aspect of the business and you know uh, if 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 you're then struggling as well for performance maybe this is not the right thing so so I I do think this this is going to drive consolidation yes the the, the thing yes. that I found really strange sorry Steve the thing that I found really strange is um I sat in a room. And there was a big heated conversation about PMS systems. I don't know if, if um, other of you were in the same room. And it was fascinating. And, and I don't I don't claim to know the names of all the different property management systems that are being used, but there was, there was lots of them. Um, they didn't feel that there was a lot of love in the room for them. Um, it also felt that uh, some property managers were saying that they've lost control. And they're, they're sort of beholden to the PMSs. Um, but there's a weird conversation going on about, I think some of the PMSs were putting prices up for utilization of channel manager for, for using, you know, either Airbnb, Booking.com, it may be. And the, the answer that everybody seemed to have is just pass it on to the guest, just increase your prices. And I'm sitting in this room thinking, yeah, but what does it do to your conversion? And nobody knew. You know, yeah. undoubtedly you guys would have known because you're, I know you track those things, but um, it really surprised me that the answer was, well, I'm just going to put prices up because I'm being given a, a, a this vertical data model I have is forcing me to uh, to sort of, you know, pass that pass that down the line. That's a very different model from Europe. Well, Graham, and it's that disconnect, right? Uh, uh, and, and you could hear the same argument presented to you on almost every single instance of somebody. If, if you went to those 200 vendors, 
every single one of them is going to tell you, oh, this is just going to be a couple of bucks more for your guest. Oh, this is going to be just a couple of more bucks to your guest. And I'm like, yeah, but why am I going to give it to you? <laughs> and, and why is this going to make? So let's see, uh, if I bring the guest here, would this make the experience much better? No. So why would I, you know, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it becomes kind of a, a, the same recurring subject, Raham. Uh, it's, it, it's the fact that some of this, PMSs or, or some of the parts of the industry have gotten injections from private equity. And because of that, they're trying to become more sophisticated, but then parts of the business are not sophisticated. Uh, and they're trying to extract the last bit of uh, performance or, or profitability from every single aspect um, of what they do. And, and it's without regard to the rest. Uh, it's very siloed as, as you clearly said it. And, and it's not, considering that there's other aspects to it that might be more important. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, so Graham, so one of the things that happened in the U.S. market, and, and certainly probably also in Europe, is that uh, there was a lot of uh, private equity money put into the supplier component. Some of that was consolidation, but some of that also resulted in them pushing prices up to their, uh, to their partners. And so now the cost of these, particularly if it's a unit uh, per unit basis, uh, you know, those are relatively flat, but now revenue is going down. At the same time that revenue is going down, I kept hearing over and over property managers, you know, basically trying to figure out how could they increase their revenue in 2024 to somehow, it, or in, as you guys were talking about, increase their take rate, right? So the percentage they take of the overall money that's generated as opposed to the more normal result of what you would do if you're heading into economic slowdown, which is start to reduce your GNA and even your cost of goods sold. So I'm just curious, Graham, because obviously you've been through a couple of different cycles and, and you've seen uh, different aspects of this from the US and, and from Europe and the UK. What, what were your thoughts? Because I, I mean, I was struck by the disconnect between what seems to be pretty obvious of what you're going to need to do over the next two years to get through this and what, in some cases, the vendors were encouraging you to, to do, which was spend money so you could drive more revenue. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, well, the way that we think, um, you know, first of all, you've said it, cash is king. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to have enough of it. Um, you've got to build that war chest Um and you do have to look into what was your cost base and then how do you pay your cost base accordingly. Um, so I tend to look at our overheads as a percentage of our revenue. And I try and make sure that that percentage is um, is staying sort of a constant or coming down effectively. So we've got some leverage. Um, but then, uh, but then on, on the flip side, effectively, um, what we've been doing as a business um, is is really understanding, you know, core fundamental profitability of a property. Is when we were growing really fast as a business, we were just taking on board volume. Um, and, you know, maybe this is what's happened to Vacasa. We can have a, a longer debate about Vacasa because there was a lot of people talking about that at the conference. You know, they're saying there's a billion of revenue there. You know, um, somebody <laughs> somehow needs to get hold of it, it needs to be taken sort of a private again, it actually needs to get rid of all the stuff they shouldn't have that just probably is not right for the portfolio. So, you know, it's not delivering sort of a value and just create an operationally high performant business because, you know, a billion of revenue has, has got value undoubtedly. So we went through a whole you know process of saying, actually, we, we churned about 1,200 properties in the last 12 months. And we said, these properties are taking millions and millions of impressions and they're not adding enough value for all the marketing dollars that we have and the cost to serve. So you've got to look everywhere, you know, look at every dollar, every cent that you're sort of spending and try and trim it accordingly when things are sort of a tough and have enough of a war chest and actually figure out ways of actually um, incentivizing consumers to buy that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, cost a huge amount effectively. So, so we do lots of things around, um, booking early and you get you know certain promotions certain advantage advantages and you know certain um pills that we can use to get people to convert a lot earlier as well so so it's looking at every part of your economic model and understanding it your cost per acquisition your cost deserve um you know 
how sensitive it is to rate. I think I said on stage on one of my panels, you know, we put prices up by, you know, a few bucks and it killed conversion by 12%. So then we started to put it up by like 25 pence and 50 pence. And we actually ended up at like, we could, we could increase by about a pound sterling and I, and conversion remained relatively stable. So, so, so then you were looking elsewhere, what could you do? Um, and, and it's that level of sophistication. Um, I, I didn't see much of it. Um, and I haven't ever really seen, you know, there's been very few, the, the very first time I looked at the US market, we were thinking of entering years and years ago. Uh, and credit to you, Steve, I think you were the only chief executive who was able to articulate your cost per acquisition of everybody we've spoken to. And I don't, I don't know if that's moved on that much. The small, smaller players, to be fair, more niche, more specialists. Um, you know, it looks to me there's a clear opportunity for some, you know, consolidation in that slightly higher end, less, um, less sort of a sensitive market. But in general, um, I didn't hear many people talking about that level of sophistication. It was more around putting prices up, um, passing on those charges, relatively unsophisticated. And that might sound brutal, but that's that's my impression. <laughs> well, you forgot the praying. Uh, it's raising up prices and praying. Okay, spray and pray, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and 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 just to be clear, Graham, that's why I think in particular, you're going to see uh, some pretty significant distressed companies uh, by August, September of 2024, right? So some of these companies have limped by uh, in uh, 2023. I mean, you can take a look at the Vacasa balance sheet and financial information because they're public. They're... Uh, their cash is pretty close, right? They're they're running about a hundred million dollars upside down. Current liabilities a hundred million dollars more than current assets. The current assets have decreased every single quarter, and they're going into the fourth quarter where last year they lost fifty million dollars on an adjusted basis. So, um, and and you know, so they're going to be really tight. And if they continue um, to churn units, which uh, they said they're churning more than projected. And their uh, churn rate was twenty percent, according to their CFO a year ago. Um, you know their their revenue could be really in bad shape next year. And so these companies that operate on cash basis, where they're most vulnerable, is um, September, August, when they start to have to do the summer owner payouts and pay their expenses and their wages. But yet the, the the revenue coming in is is so low, and then if the booking window is shrinking due to credit uh, consumer credit issues, then that's a problem. So, I foresee a lot of opportunities, and I'm curious, um, uh, Paul, because you were in that um, presentation with Graham and his good friend uh, Henrik um, from Aways. Uh, they were, you know, I'm I'm surprised they didn't talk about wanting to get into the U.S. market because there was one large shareholder. Um, having private meetings with people and seemingly offering um, to serve as a mediator for his company for sale. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, why these two uh, weren't jumping at the opportunity to go into the U S market. <laughs> well, we have Graham here. So uh, well, we, we can... I'm going to take some notes here. <laughs> yeah. We can ask him directly, Steve. You don't have to <laughs> directly ask him. Um uh, no, I, I, I thought that was a really interesting uh, conversation. As I said, uh, uh, I've always found, you know, that it makes no sense that the U.S. is so fragmented. And, and to be quite honest, Steve, so backwards. I told you when I, you know, I, I was, my background is from the other type of hospitality. And and when I, when I, when I started looking at this industry, I was like, they do things, you know, almost the way they, that they were done like 15 years ago uh, in the other hospitality. Uh, channel management, there's no strategy. The way they review pricing makes no sense. I mean, there's no dynamic pricing per se here. I mean, it, there's really no understanding of conversion um, and uh, or or consumer behavior. There's there's no individualization and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think, uh, Steve, that that it would, in my mind at least, um, that this industry is actually ripe for the right type of consolidation. Uh, the problem we had is that the examples we had of consolidation in the U.S., some of them failed and, and it's always obviously different reasons that you know um I don't want to go back 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 but 
if we go simply to like, for example, the Winhams of the world, uh, where you had the conflict between the traditional hospitality that didn't understand the new incumbent product and, and then decided to neglect it or kill it via corporate expense allocation. And then they kill the idea because of that. They, that, that was never gonna work because they basically were afraid of it. Um, so, so it didn't work because of that. And, and to, to the more recent one, where you got a company that was confused uh, about being a tech company and completely forgetting about the fact that you're not a tech company, you're in the hospitality uh, business. So it's not just about units uh, and just getting them on board at whatever cost. You have to be very mindful uh, of every aspect uh, of, of, of the, um, I would say of the macro process, Otherwise, you're never going to be profitable. And, and that's basically the consequence of what's going on with the Casa. Uh, just to point out the difference, uh, Graham, and by the way, uh, uh, today is Friday, and Graham shares started resharing uh, Friday data. Uh, these companies, Bacasa in particular, would massively benefit if they would just follow Graham and take a look at those LinkedIn posts uh, that he does on Friday. Because every, every little aspect uh, uh, that is relevant they're very analytical and they and they go very, very deep uh, to understand, even from an onboarding perspective, uh, once they decided on a unit and they onboarded it, they're very keen at understanding exactly in which week you're going to create churn if you don't have a booking um, and so on and so forth. So uh, being this methodical about it, as opposed to, oh, let's just buy growth at whatever price, which is what the tech companies did. Uh, but it doesn't work here. If you don't get every aspect right, it's never going to work. So, uh, so Steve, I, I, I think, I think that what's happening is uh, Graham is basically waiting to do a partnership with us, uh, and and that's going to be the conclusion of uh, this very long segue answer. Well, but Graham, don't you think it would be more fun if someone from Europe or the UK were to buy Vacasa and uh, try to salvage it? I mean, I, you know, I know Henrik was basically joking and saying he'd rather go into Germany or Denmark. Uh, but, you know, Platinum Equity might be interested. Uh, I know you have a big PE company behind you. Wouldn't it be entertaining? I mean, I know you like the U.S. market. There's, You're a wine collector. There's a good opportunity to spend time in Napa and Sonoma. Uh, wouldn't it be entertaining or or maybe another uh, company buying Vacasa? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the guy actually... Um... A billion of revenues, I think, is really attractive. <laughs> and I think that's the number. You can write me from wrong, you know. And I, and I sort of, I scratch my head and think, what can I do with a billion of revenue? You know, because I, I think that Casa should be doing 50 to 100 million even now. And I think it probably could. I genuinely think it could. But it would take a hell of a lot of effort and it would really take the right management team to go in to sort it out and it would be a very different type of business i suspect from what it is today um the supply model will be completely different you know the volume i, I don't know for it you know 35 38 000 properties i suspect you could do that with considerably less properties you, know, you get rid of all the stuff that you just shouldn't have on your portfolio um you'd stop maybe calling yourself a tech company and remind that actually you're in the job of making memories and taking people on holiday um and you'd really focus on them um, building a bigger brand and share direct so 50 percent plus of the business is coming direct through crm through repeat booting through loyalty schemes etc cetera, etc cetera. um but that's going to take a lot of time it's going to take a lot of effort and and i think when i look at it and I have to suppress the sort of a, the the entrepreneur in me and the sort of a, the maverick in me, because I look at what we have to do, and we have such a big job to do in our portfolio as well. Now, what it would probably take for someone like the business I look after and Henrik's business is for someone to come along and to write a very large check, um, in excess of a billion, because that's what it would have to be, um, given the size of our businesses, to 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 acquire both of us from um, the current um, private equity house, maybe not quite the same in in um, in platinum um, because of just what they do, um, and then you know reset a timeline and uh, bring the operational side of these businesses sort of together to try and get some synergies and some economies of scale. Um, it it it's it, it's interesting, but whilst there's still a lot to do in the UK, still a lot to do in Europe, um, it would be a hell of a distraction. And the problem we have is, is you mentioned debt markets, you know, 
nobody's writing checks for a billion pounds plus or a billion dollars. Deal flow of that level is down 75% in Europe year on year. Um, private equity companies are just sitting with a wash of money. They can't get rid of it, but they're too afraid to get rid of it. So it's a really tough environment and market. And I think that's part of the issue you've got with Silver Lake and investors in the past at the moment is just trying to work out actually where do they go? You know, they're sort of a stuck uh, in terms of in terms of what they want to do. Um, but it, it would be, um, it would be, I don't know enough about the business, but it would be, uh, it'd be an interesting challenge. So, so Paul, you know, uh, Vacasa actually, their 12 months is $1.15 billion of revenue. Um, and yet they're still losing money on an adjusted EBITDA basis, which is just surreal. Um, I would say Graham's being conservative, just pegging 10% uh, margin on that amount. But I, I'm just curious from your standpoint, would, would a company at this point take the gamble to try to figure out, could they salvage this company? Could they figure out a way to, um, with that kind of revenue, although now they're saying their unit count is uh, churning more than uh, historical uh, and you could be buying literally a melting icy cube, but is someone going to take the gamble that they could turn this around? Because that is a lot of revenue. Uh, it depends on the price, Steve. Uh, and I think uh, that's what's going to make, make this a compelling opportunity. Uh, I do think that step one for somebody coming in, and Graham is absolutely right, it's, it's going to be massive cleanup. So you're basically going to, to come in and say, okay, good bank, good bank, good bank, bad bank type of strategy and everything that's either not dense enough to be uh, profitable to be operated in the near future goes to the bad bank and and, and you separate the two things. So you basically have to do that analysis, Steve, and, and come to a conclusion as to you know, what's a decent price for that. I, I, I actually think it will be in their better interest to do that themselves because I think that will give them some time to solve for the bad bank and maybe you can even... Uh, allocated to other players as well, uh, but uh, but but I do think at the end of the day, Steve, it's 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 how you define that strategy. If they're still thinking that there's going to be a flip uh, sometime soon and that they're going to be able to go back to the, I, I guess, uh, if they add some AI, uh, now they can jump into that wave and and say they're an AI enabled company, whatever. Uh, it's it, uh, I think that train has passed. Uh, to be quite honest. So uh, the, the only solution is really get down to the reality of things, uh, assume the business you're in, uh, in reality, and assume the quality of the asset you acquired. And, and with that in mind, let's start fixing things. And that's going to take some very gutsy calls in terms of saying, you know, all of this doesn't really work for us. Let's kill it. Uh, this is the good side of it. Let's, let's nurture it. Let's make sure that we can package it in a nice way. And with the bad bank, let's just kill it uh, as soon as we can, or, or or send it somebody else, so that at least we stop losing money, uh, uh, stop lo losing money from it. And and you know, Steve, you know part of it, and, and Graham knows this better than we do because we don't have that problem. But but the maintenance costs that they have for their um, proprietary systems, it's just massive uh, for the value they're extracting out of it. So you know, I. I'm I'm hopeful uh, that they do have very good data, so I think that at least they should be capable of very quickly coming up with uh, with what's worth it and what's not, and and start driving up a strategy for that. Uh, and maybe the best way to do this, maybe you're right, is is out of the public eyes because this is going to be very complicated uh, to achieve as they're also trying to sell the story to the market that is completely different. Yeah. So Graham, last question on Vacasa, because we could spend all day on this. Um, so their uh, spend on technology is 62 uh, million a year, sales on uh, or expenses on sales and marketing, which is their organic component is 222 million a year. Um, you know, there's some tempting numbers here that you could definitely start to say, hey, we could synergize this. So who says yes first to a, a merger? Would it be... Uh, Sykes? Would it be a Waze? Would it maybe be a company uh, out of Asia? Who Who's going to want to, you know, because I know that there's not going to be some a cash buyer. Uh, it would be more likely a merger, but who who's going to say yes to this tempting opportunity? I, I mean, you know, look at this, look at this opportunity to cut, cut your way to potentially a hundred. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, look, I mean, I think it, I think it's, um, 
I think it's really it personally, parking everything aside, it's the type of thing that really interests me as a CEO. Because um as I said, a one point one billion of revenues, all of that cost. Um you know, the right management team, building out the right management team and just a ruthless focus, as Paul said, on uh, efficiencies and making all those sort of hard decisions, I think is really interesting. However, <laughs> however, there's still a lot of work to be done <laughs> elsewhere, effectively. And, you know, you can spend all your time, you know, take our business all the time, trying to fix out the problem over here and destroy all the, all the value over there. And so, um, I think, think it would depend on the price. So if someone comes along and says, you know, what's the market cap today? About 170, 170 million, roughly. Um, some... Yeah, it's 180 million, give or take. But in a, a private conversation with a shareholder of Vacasa, uh, I was told, you know, they're not going to look at that valuation uh, to for their asset. They're, they're looking for much more now, you know. That could be wishful thinking or poker playing by that individual. We had a nice dinner with them. But, um, you know, my guess is uh, because this would have to be approved by the board of director, they're going to be looking for a premium, right? So now it becomes a game of of kind of playing around with valuation. Because at the end of the day, if they have 40,000 contracts or 35,000, whatever the heck the number truly is, that's revenue producing contracts. Um, you know, that asset is worth something. And the technology piece, uh, we talked about this before, let them keep the technology piece. Let them, you know, let um, let let Silver Lake keep the technology piece and and you become a client and let them try to create the next guest or whatever. And and you just keep the contracts. Um, you know, there there is a business model there, but the cleanup and the margin for potential chaos is pretty high. And, um, you know, you're dealing with human beings and uh, uh, like a market in the U.S. where the work, uh, you know, unemployment is very tight. I mean, this could go very bad very quickly um, because, you know, if you lose key employees, uh, particularly in those, you know, local offices, you could just be hemorrhaging contracts. So I think that's, you know, there, there's a huge risk factor that it would have to be baked into any deal here. Yeah, no, I agree. No. So, but um, who knows? We'll circle back in 12 years' time and see what's going on in the world. That, that's not a no here, Paul. So, Paul, um, I want to talk about something else, your favorite topic, OTAs. And uh, you were, you got to sit in a couple different meetings with different OTAs. Yes. Um, yeah. What was your impression from the meetings with the OTAs? Did any OTAs, uh, stand out as uh, he you would you think is ready to kind of uh, make a better uh, impact in 2024 2025 in the U.S. market. Yes, uh, Steve, Booking.com definitely. Uh, um, so as you know, one of the beauties, and I think we and I have discussed it at nauseum as well. Uh, the beauty of uh, this type of hospitality versus the traditional one is there is no rate parity. Um, so uh, we're not bound by that same constraint that they basically get on the other side. And, and to be honest, the level of maturity from the OTAs is also different. Um, when you engage in a conversation with Airbnb, uh, you know, it, it's almost like they view you as a nuance uh, as opposed to understanding that you are, in, in, in fact, their largest component uh, of, of, you, of, of inventory. Um, and... And, and they have that attitude. And, and when you talk to somebody like Booking.com, so Booking is obviously been in this business for many more years. Um, and so they understand, in my view at least, the traveler uh, better. Uh, and, and, and I think that, that you know, their recent uh, 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 numbers and results that they're getting from the US market and what they're doing in Europe is basically a testament of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, the meetings, you see how their, I guess their mentality is more on a partnership type of um, negotiation rather than, oh, I I have all the cards and you do as you're told, uh, as we had with some of the other vendors. Um, and uh, and and so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that uh, that humbleness uh, and that, um, I would say, uh, being more hungry 
to capture market share uh, is, is, is going to be uh, advantageous for somebody that understands how to deal with them. So, Graham, uh, I know you're mostly direct, but you do have some OTA business in the UK market. Um, and my guess is Booking.com is a pretty dominant force in the UK. I'm curious, do you use Airbnb at all? Or um, have you just kind of stuck with Booking.com and more UK-based OTAs? Um, you're right. I mean, we're mostly direct, but um, Paul, Paul's articulation is perfect. Booking.com, think like a partnership. That's my observation. Um, they're super smart people. They're very numbers driven. They're very data driven. They think a lot about the guest, the guest experience, and they think about conversion optimization that benefits them and ultimately benefits you as a property manager. And that, that's what you want. Um, Airbnb, we don't use at all, really, um, Steve. I mean, I, I think we've got a few properties on it, but but it's like pushing water up a hill. And um, and, and and it's not really something we want to get into either, quite frankly. I think Airbnb, and I listen to some interviews of Brian Chesky and I see what's happening at Airbnb. And, and, and you know, <laughs> If I was a business that was heavily reliant on Airbnb as a property manager, I would be worried about some of the things they're doing. They're trying to become like a super, super sort of a PMS. They're trying to completely disintermediate and host, in my opinion. It's all about the guest. Um, and I think in 12 to 24 months' time, with his lens on product and what he's doing, um, it will be a very different business. So whereas I think booking.com, you know, if you look at the financial numbers of booking.com, okay, they don't have the same, uh, you know, multiple effectively in terms of, you know, how they sort of value, but it is a phenomenal business in terms of the uh, the financial sort of performance of that business. And it's a vertical integrated because they've got all the different travel lines and all the categories that they can utilize as well. We, uh, about 12 months ago, I made the decision um, to give booking.com all of our supply. Um, Prior to that, we we controlled very much what we're giving them. But then what we did is we worked very closely with them about putting that supply onto their genius program, which is a loyalty program, which is just genius in terms of what it does to conversion. And we were able to work together to surgically target which properties, particularly for last minute bookings. And, and, and you mentioned that, you know, the, the, the length of stay and the booking window shrunk by about 20% year on year. And actually, they're a great platform for that, um, who deliver a really good return on investment. We'll always keep them at arm's length, probably. So um, to give you the numbers, Steve, they're about 7% of our bookings. Um, but, but we see it much more as a, as a sort of a partnership, um, two-way sort of a conversation. Yes. Yeah, so, Paul, um, I know you had a chance to meet some of the executives at Booking.com. Uh, including Ben Harrell, who's in charge of the U.S. market. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, while Booking.com dominates Europe and then effectively Booking Holdings, Agoda dominates Asia, uh, the U.S. market has been kind of the elusive piece for them of their uh, world domination. But uh, interestingly enough, Glenn Fogel, their CEO, lives in New York, and they've made the U.S. market an emphasis and I'm sure you've seen the stats that there are more people that have downloaded the Booking.com app than Airbnb. I think it was 80 million people downloaded it in uh, 2022 versus 52 million for Airbnb. And even in the U.S. market now, 17 million downloaded it versus 13 million for Airbnb. And um, I'm just curious your observations from those conversations, because when I talk to people at the VMA, some of them still weren't even aware of booking.com let alone having a connection with uh, booking.com well and 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 to be honest Steve uh I I think that uh a lot of the property managers and as I said you know some of them are not necessarily um that old in the industry to understand OTA, OTA behavior I've seen it uh uh in the airlines I've seen it in in traditional hospitality um, and 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 now in this space, uh, so you really can understand when somebody like Airbnb is solely inwardly focused, uh, as 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 Abraham said, uh, they really don't care. They want this intermediate, and that's their sole purpose, and that's why you know for us, uh, we are more a nuance uh, to them than anything else. And you could see that 
disconnect Steve with the discussion we had with them on a, I would say on an ancillary item uh, and how aroused they were that well, I'm not going to give you my data and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not your data. I own, I have the, I'm the one who has the contract not you, but anyhow, uh, it's, 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 it's those type of things, uh, where it starts getting, uh, you know, really logical, uh, on the flip side, uh, I think their approach, uh, and I think what's going to happen to Steve, especially because, um, uh, as Graham noted, you're very well known in the industry and, 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 uh, and I think you're very open about, you know, our results, at least with booking.com and they have been spectacular spectacular this year they have somewhat compensated uh some of the downfall from the uh you know uh, vervo adjustment or whatever you want to call that happening um uh that's been going on this year uh and and to be honest uh it's also easier to deal with them uh because they understand that uh what's there for them to capture and that's why i was i was referring to that i, I guess humble and hungry approach they have in the u.s uh, they're hungry for for market share, uh, and they're willing to work with 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 you. And I, I, this is, to to be honest, this is the opportunity to build that solid partnership uh, relationship that's going to have you know its nice uh, elements that it's going to make it sustainable for the long run. Um, and 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 if you if you're part of it, uh, and and you're strategic about how to go about it, uh, I think there's a lot of value that can be captured because they're willing to invest. Uh, and one of the things you know uh, that it's really expensive in the U.S. as well is the uh, guest acquisition cost, uh, uh, and, and and you know how creative you have to get uh, in terms of how you find those guests and how you you personalize uh, their offering. It's really expensive. Uh, so if you can partner with somebody to get some of it uh, um, in an efficient way as as part of your channel cost, I think it's 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 smart to structure it um, and to get it right. Uh, once you have the opportunity, One, if 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 we wait and and see when you know when Booking.com has you know whatever um, a market share, maybe those opportunities won't be available to the fragmented smaller uh, industry players. And I think uh, that's an opportunity that should be captured by uh, by all of them at this point. Yeah. So um, we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about VRBO Expedia in part because they're really a non-factor in Europe slash the UK. But Graham, just kind of. Uh, Expedia is a big player in the U.S. market, and they own VRBO, and there's been a noticeable decline of VRBO uh, market share in uh, 2023. Conversion. Yeah, conversion, market share, um, ad spend, et cetera. This is part of this disruption, which I think is endangering some of these property managers who, in many cases, the only channel they were on was VRBO, and now uh, Expedia is trying to integrate all that VRBO into Expedia. And it looks to me like they're going to uh, not sunset Verbo, but you know it'll be a mature channel where their focus will be Expedia. But there's a lot of disruption, and most of the software systems in the U.S., including interestingly enough, Escapia, which is owned by Verbo slash HomeAway, do not have a direct in, uh, connection with Expedia. So uh, you can imagine uh, the kind of turmoil in the U.S. market as as this um, continues. But I wanted to ask you both. Uh, I'll start with Graham uh, as you're budgeting. You know, Henrik Kelberg kind of set the stage back in London that, uh, you know, 2024, he was pretty concerned with 2024 outlook for Europe, in part because of wars, uh, the the war in, in Israel in particular, uh, potential civil unrest in major European cities, um, potential oil spikes and terrorism and things like that. Um, I'm not sure if the UK market is the same, although I have seen you know reports of unrest in London. But as you start to look at budgeting, or you probably already have an initial budget for 2024, are you being conservative? Um, are you kind of viewing 2024 as a cautious period as we enter this next year? So, so, so I wrote a list, Steve, before this call <laughs> of all the uh, headwinds. Um, Indulge me for a second, it's, uh, it's quite depressing, really. So the UK has weak productivity, uh, which is a great measure of sort of overall health. So, you know, 0.6% GDP growth. We've got a weak pound versus the dollar. We've got 2.6 trillion of debt, 900 billion of that added post-COVID. We have a stealth tax, which I won't go into the detail of, but basically people are paying more tax. Um, we've got high cooperation tax, never great for businesses. We've got a labor shortage, 
we've got the lowest GFK consumer confidence score since they started recording it, which is about 25 years ago. Um, and uh, 60% of the UK are on fixed mortgages, which are probably going to end soon in the next couple of years. We've got an election coming. We're definitely going to have a change of government. Um, inflation is falling, but it's nowhere near the raise it needs to be. 4.6% um, versus uh, sort of a 2%. Um, and consumers are really very, very cautious. Um, on the positive side, people love going on holiday. And, um, people people will. I was at an event yesterday. I was sitting next to a, a huge uh, food and beverage and retailer, um, 10,000 plus employees. And, and she was saying to me that, you know, people are just not going out and spending the same amount of money in, uh, in her restaurants. And she says that's because they're all buying holidays. Um, so holidays definitely people will prioritize. But to be prudent, we've set our budget. And, 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 and you know me, I'm pretty open and honest, you know, so broad brush, we're sort of saying our supply is going to grow by about 12%. And so we forecast that our revenue will grow in line with supply. That's roughly what we're forecasting. Um, we, we are holding back quite a big contingency, and that includes cash, as you would imagine, uh, which is important, but also contingency we're holding should things be quite sort of a challenging we um we're focusing very much on leveraging our EBITDA margin, so cost control. So we're doing a lot of activity as we as we face in sort of saying, you know, I'm still going to invest about 30 million in initiatives over the next 12 months, which is you know what we will do for growth initiatives. But how we release that funding, we're going to be very conservative as well. And when it comes to rate, you know, we're forecasting versus our base rate last year about a 3% growth in rate. Um, so that is quite a cautious budget for us as a business that's normally growing 20% sort of a plus. So EBITDA leverage, margin expansion, hold on to the cash, hold a big contingency, um, and relatively conservative with growth in line with um, supply. Last year, our supply was actually not a problem for us. It's probably one of the first years in the seven and a half years I've looked after this business, supply has been okay. It was demand that was our um our, our biggest sort of a challenge. And it's just uh, managing that accordingly. So Paul, not, not a very rosy picture painted for the UK. Uh, I'd say the US has as many of these challenges, uh, maybe more, certainly worker shortage, uh, consumer confidence, consumers tapping credit, um, high interest rates, the housing market has really slowed down significantly. Um, obviously, funding wars, um, campus unrest, and then um, we're also heading into, for sure, a contentious presidential election, which usually um, causes consumers to stop spending around that 60 days prior to the election. And hopefully, if ballots aren't uh, counted right away, it could be longer. So, you know, how how conservative are you being in terms of uh, revenue projections? Well, uh, and, and you already know this, but it's the same approach as Graham just described. Uh, so, so yeah, we're very, very conservative on the on the top line. I'm actually surprised to see that it's also 3%. So uh, uh, maybe we're with our minds, Graham, uh, but it's fairly similar our outcome in terms of the revenue projections that we're still working on. Uh, we, we also found that we could um, remove uh, or try to remove fixed cost. Uh, so we're making it variable so that it will correspond better to our to our cash uh, flow uh, seasonality. And with that, we can preserve more cash. So we're doing that as well in some functions that were non-core. Uh, and we're stripping out that fixed cost as well so that uh, we, we, we increase our defensiveness uh, from that perspective. And, and become more uh, adaptable, I would say, to uh, changing market conditions, especially on, as I said, non-core um, um, functions. Uh, and obviously we're being very careful with, with margins and, and making sure that every little thing gets counted correctly, inefficiently and automated. Um, so, so most of those initiatives, Steve, have already been embedded into the budget uh, for next year. And we, we did have some sizable, I, I said, opportunities uh, uh, that we captured. Uh, and, uh, and, and and yeah, just hunkering down and, and, and being ready for whatever uh, 2024 throws at us. All right. Well, Graham, it sounds like uh, you and Paul are 
cut from the same cloth. You're both being very conservative. Uh, there definitely is a storm out there. Everybody, at least on this podcast, is battening down the hatches, managing expenses, uh, cost cutting wherever, because revenue is not likely to improve uh, in 2024 or over 2023, and it could actually go down. So uh, with that, I thank you, Paul, uh, Graham, Heather, as always, for another great episode of Straight Fire VR. For those who want uh, previous episodes, go to our website, straightfirevr.com, or you can also email us at straightfirevr at gmail.com. Thank you again.